All right, Mr. Billings, I've pressed the record button. We can begin our session. Why don't you start by telling me why you came to see me today? I came to you because I want to tell you my story. I can't go to a priest because I'm not Catholic. I can't go to a lawyer because I haven't done anything to consult a lawyer about. All I did was kill my kids, one at a time. Kill them all. Do you mean you actually killed them or... No! But I was responsible. Denny, 1967. Cheryl, 1971. And Andy was this year. I want to tell you about it. They were murdered, you see? Only no one believes that. If they would, then things would be all right. Why is that? Because... Because, well, what is that? What's what? That door. The closet. Where I hang my coat and leave my overshoes. Open it. I want to see. Is that all right, Mr. Billings? All right. You were saying... <clears throat> you were saying that if the murder of your three children could be proved, all your troubles would be over. Why is that? I'd go to jail for life. And you can see into all the rooms in a jail. All the rooms. How were your children murdered? Don't try to jerk it out of me, I'll tell you. Don't worry. I'm not one of your freaks strutting around pretending to be Napoleon or explaining that I got hooked on heroin because my mother didn't love me. I know you won't believe me, and I don't care. It doesn't matter. Just to tell will be enough. All right. <sighs> I married Rita in 1965. I was 21 and she was 18. She was pregnant. That was Denny. I had to leave college and get a job, but I didn't mind. I love both of them. We were very happy. Rita got pregnant just a little while after Denny was born, and Cheryl came along in December of 1966. Andy came in the summer of 1969, and Denny was already dead by then. Andy was an accident. That's what Rita said. She said, sometimes that birth control stuff doesn't work. I think that it was more than an accident. Children tie a man down, you know? Women like that, especially when a man is brighter than they. Don't you find that's true? Well, I don't know. Eh, it doesn't matter. I loved him anyway. Who killed the children? The boogeyman. The boogeyman killed them all. Just came out of the closet and killed them. <laughs> you... you you think I'm crazy, all right. It's written all over you. But I don't care. All I want to do is tell you and then get lost. Well, I'm listening. It started when Denny was almost two and Cheryl was just an infant. He started crying when Rita put him to bed. We had a two-bedroom place, see? Cheryl slept in a crib in our room. At first I thought he was crying because, you know, he didn't have a bottle to take to bed anymore. Rita said, don't make an issue of it, let it go, let him have it, and he'll drop it on his own. But that's the way kids start off bad. You get permissive with them, spoil them, then they break your heart. Get some girl knocked up, you know, or start shooting dope. Or they get to be sissies. Can you imagine waking up some morning finding your kid, your son, is a sissy? After a while, though, when he didn't stop, I started putting him to bed myself. And if he didn't stop crying, I'd give him a whack. Then Rita said he was saying light over and over again. I don't know. Kids that little, I don't know how you can tell what they're saying. Only a mother can tell. So, Rita wanted to put in a nightlight. One of those wall plug things with Mickey Mouse or Huckleberry Hound or something like that on it. I wouldn't let her. If a kid doesn't get over being afraid of the dark when he's little, he never gets over it. Anyway, he... He died the summer after Cheryl was born. I put him to bed that night, and he started to cry right off. I heard what he said that time. He pointed right at the closet when he said it. Boogeyman, the kid says. Boogeyman, Daddy. Turned off the light, and I went into a room and asked Rita why she wanted to teach that kid a word like that. I was tempted to slap her around a little, but I didn't. She said she never taught him how to say that. I called her a goddamn liar. That was a bad summer for me, see? 
The only job I could get was loading Pepsi Cola trucks in a warehouse. And I was tired all the time. Cheryl would wake up and cry every night, and Rita would pick her up and sniffle. Tell you, sometimes I felt like throwing them both out the window. Christ. Kids drive you crazy sometimes. You could kill them. The kid woke me up at three in the morning, right on schedule. I went to the bathroom, only a quarter awake. Rita asked me if I'd check on Denny. I told her to do it herself and went back to bed. I was almost asleep when she started to scream. I got up and went in. The kid was dead on his back, just as white as flour except for where the, the blood had, had sunk. Back of the legs, the head, the, uh, the buttocks. His eyes were open. That was the worst, you know. Wide, open, and glassy, like the eyes you see on a moose head some guy put over his mantle. Like pictures you see of those gook kids over a nom. But an American kid shouldn't look like that. Dead on his back. Wearing diapers and rubber pants because he'd been wetting himself. Awful. I love that kid. Rita was screaming her head off. She tried to pick Denny up and rock him, but I wouldn't let her. The cops don't like you to touch any of the evidence. I know that. Did you know it was the boogeyman then? Oh, no. Not then, but I did see one thing. It didn't mean anything to me then, but my mind stored it away. What was that? The closet door was open. Not much. Just a crack. But I know I left it shut, see? There's dry cleaning bags in there. Kid messes around with one of those and bango. Asphyxiation, you know that? What happened then? <sighs> we planted him. Was there an inquest? Sure. Some backcountry fuckhead with a stethoscope and a black bag full of junior mints and a sheepskin from some clown college. Crib death, he called it. Have you ever heard of such a pile of yellow manure? The kid was three years old. Crib death is most common during the first year, but that diagnosis has gone on death certificates for children up to age five. For want of a better bullshit! <clears> hmm. <throat> yes. We moved Cheryl into Denny's room a month after the funeral. Rita fought it tooth and nail, but I had the last word. It hurt me. Of course it did. Jesus, I loved having that kid with us. But you can't get overprotective. You make a kid a cripple that way. When I was a kid, my mom used to take me to the beach and then scream herself hoarse. Don't go out so far. Don't go there. It's got an undertow. You only ate an hour ago. Don't get over your head. Even to watch out for sharks before God. <sighs> so what happens? I can't even go near the water now. It's the truth. I get the cramps if I go near the beach. Rita got me to take her and the kids to Salvin Rock once. And when Denny was alive, I got sick as a dog. I know, see? You can't overprotect kids. And you can't coddle yourself either. Life goes on. Cheryl went right into Denny's crib. We sent the old mattress to the dump, though. I didn't want my girl getting any germs. So, a year goes by. And one night, I'm putting Cheryl into her crib. She starts to yowl and scream and cry. Boogeyman, Daddy. Boogeyman. Boogeyman. That threw a jump into me. It was just like Denny. And I started to remember about that closet door. Opened just a crack when we found him. I wanted to take her into our room for the night. Hadn't did you? No. How could I go to Rita and admit I was wrong? I had to be strong. She was always such a jellyfish. Look how easy she went to bed with me when we weren't married. Oh, on the other hand, look how easily you went to bed with her. Are you trying to be a wise guy? No, indeed. Then let me tell it my way. I came here to get this off my chest, to tell my story. I'm not going to talk about my sex life if that's what you expect. Rita and I had a very normal sex life with none of that dirty stuff. I know it gives some people a charge to talk about that, but I'm not one of them. Okay. Okay. 
I noticed your eyes keep wandering to the door. Would you like that open? No. <laughs> what do I want to look at oversized shoes for? The boogeyman got her too. Ugh. The boogeyman got her too, a month later. But something happened before that. I heard a noise in there one night. And then she screamed. I opened the door real quick. The hall light was on and... She was sitting up in the crib and crying and... Something moved. Back in the shadows, by, by the closet, something, something slithered. Was the closet door open? A little. Just a crack. Shirl was screaming about that boogeyman. And something else that sounded like claws. Only she said craws, you know. Little, little kids have trouble with the L sound. Rita ran upstairs and asked what the matter was. I said she got scared by the shadows of the branches moving on the ceiling. Cross it. Huh? Closet. Maybe she was trying to say closet. Huh. Maybe. Yeah, maybe that was it. I don't think so. I think it was claws. Yeah, claws. Long claws. Did you look in the closet? Yeah. Was there anything in there? Did you see the... I didn't see anything! <sighs> when she died, I found her. See? And she was black. All... Oh, black. She swallowed her own tongue. Her eyes. They look like those eyes you see on stuffed animals. All shiny and awful. Like live marbles. And they were saying, It got me, Daddy. You let it get me. You killed me. You helped it kill me. <laughs> it was a brain convulsion, see? Bad signal in the brain. They had an autopsy at Hartford receiving, and they told us she choked on a tongue from the convulsion. And I had to go home alone because they kept Rita under sedation. She was out of her mind. I had to go back to the house, all alone. And I know a kid don't just get convulsions because the brain frigged up. You can scare a kid into convulsions. And I had to go back to the house where it was. I slept on the couch with the light on. Did anything happen? I had a dream. I was in a dark room. There was something I couldn't... Something I couldn't quite see in the closet. It made a noise. A squishy noise. It reminded me of a comic book I read when I was a kid. Tales from the Crypt. You remember that? Christ! They had a guy named Graham Ingalls. He could draw every god-awful thing in the world and some out of it. Anyway, in this story, this woman drowned her husband, see? Put cement blocks on his feet and dropped him into a quarry. Only he came back. He was all rotted and black-green, and the fish had eaten away one of his eyes, and there was seaweed in his hair. He came back and killed her. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, I thought that would be leaning over me with claws. Long claws. When your wife came back home, what was her attitude toward you? She still loved me. <laughs> She still wanted to do what I told her. That's the wife's place, right? This woman's lib only makes sick people. The most important thing in life is for a person to know his place. His, um, his... Station in life. That's it. That's it exactly. And a wife should follow her husband. Oh, she was sort of colorless the first four or five months after. Dragged around the house, didn't sing, didn't watch the TV, didn't laugh. I knew she'd get over it. When they're that little, you don't get so attached to them. After a while, you have to go to the bureau drawer and look at a picture to even remember exactly what they look like. <sighs> she wanted another baby. I told her it was a bad idea. Oh, not forever, but for a while. I told her it was time for us to get over things and begin to enjoy each other. We never had a chance to do that before. 
If you wanted to go to a movie, you had to hassle around for a babysitter. You couldn't go into town to see the Mets unless her folks would take the kids. Because my mom wouldn't have anything to do with us. Denny was born too soon after we were married, see? She said Rita was just a tramp. A common little corner walker. Corner walker is what my mom always called them. She sat me down once and told me diseases you can get if you went with a corner, you know, to a prostitute. How your, prick, well, your penis has just a little tiny sore on it one day and the next it's rotten right off. She wouldn't even come to the wedding. Anyway, Rita's gynecologist sold her on this thing called an IUD. Entering some kind of device foolproof, the doctor said. He just sticks it up the woman's, you know, a place. And that's it. If there's anything in there, the egg can't fertilize. Well, no one knows if it's there or not. In the next year, she's pregnant again. Some foolproof. Well, no birth control method is perfect. The pill is only 98%. The IUD may be ejected by cramps, strong menstrual flow, and, in exceptional cases, by evacuation. Yeah, or you could just take it out. That's also possible. So, what's next? She's knitting little things, singing in the shower, and eating pickles like crazy. Sitting on my lap and saying things about how it must have just been God's will. Piss. The baby came at the end of the year after Cheryl's death? That's right, a boy. She named it Andrew Lester Billings. I didn't want anything to do with it, at least at first. My motto was she screwed up, so let her take care of it. I know how that sounds, but you have to remember that I'd been through a lot. But I warmed up to him. You know what? He was the only one of the litter that looked like me, for one thing. Denny looked like his mother, and Cheryl didn't look like anybody. Except maybe my Grammy Ann. But Andy was the spitting image of me. I'd get to playing around with him in his playpen when I got home from work. He'd grab only my finger and smile and gurgle. Nine weeks old and the kid was grinning up at his old dad. You believe that? Then one night, here I am, coming out of a drugstore with a mobile to hang over the kid's crib. Me. Kids don't appreciate parents until they're old enough to say thank you. That was always my motto. But there I was, buying him some silly crap. And all at once I realized... I love him the most of all. I had another job by then, pretty good one. Selling drill bits for Cluett and Sons. I did real well. And when Andy was one, we moved to Waterbury. The old place had too many bad memories and too many closets. That next year was the best one for us. I'd give every finger on my right hand to have it back again. Oh, the war in Vietnam was still going on, and the hippies were still running around with no clothes on. But none of that touched us. We were on a quiet street with nice neighbors. We were happy. I asked Rita once if she wasn't worried. You know, bad luck comes in threes and all that. She said not for us. She said Andy was special. She said God had drawn a ring around him. <sighs> the last year wasn't so good. I started keeping my boots in the hall because I didn't like to open the closet door anymore. I kept thinking, well, what if it's in there? All crouched down, ready to spring the second I opened the door. And I started thinking I could hear squishy noises. As if something black and green and wet was moving around in there just a little. Rita asked me if I was working too hard. And I started to snap at her, just like the old days. I got sick to my stomach, leaving them alone to go to work. But I was glad to get out. God help me, I was glad to get out. I started to think, see, that it lost us for a while when we moved. It had to hunt around, slinking through the streets at night and maybe creeping in the sewers, smelling for us. It took a year, but it found us. It's back. It wants Andy. And it wants me. I started to think maybe if you think of a thing long enough and believe in it, it gets real. Maybe all the monsters we were scared of when we were kids, Frankenstein and Wolfman and Mummy, 
Maybe they were real. Real enough to kill the kids that were supposed to have fallen into gravel pits or drowned in lakes or were just never found. Maybe. Are you backing away from something, Mr. Billings? And he died in February. Rita wasn't there. She got a call from her father. Her mother had been in a car crash the day after New Year's and wasn't expected to live. She took a bus back that night. Her mother didn't die, but she was on the critical list for a long time, two months. I had a very good woman who stayed with Andy days. We kept house nights, and closet doors kept coming open. The kid was sleeping in the room with me. It's funny, too. Rita asked me once when he was two if I wanted to move him into another room. Spock or one of those other quacks claims it's bad for kids to sleep with their pants, see? It's supposed to give them trauma about sex and all that. But we never did it unless the kid was asleep, and I didn't want to move him. I was afraid to, after Denny and Cheryl. But you did move him, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I had to! I had to. It was all right when Rita was there, but when she was gone, it started to get bolder. It started... Oh, you won't believe it. I know what you think. Just another goofy for your casebook. I know that. But you weren't there, you lousy, smug head peeper. Every door in the house blew wide open. One morning I got up and found a trail of mud and filth across the hall between the coat closet and the front door. Was it going out? Coming in? Records all scratched up and covered with slime, mirrors broken, and the sounds. Oh, the sounds. You'd wake up at three in the morning and look into the dark, and at first you'd say, it's only the clock. But underneath it, you could hear something moving in a stealthy way, but not too stealthy because it wanted you to hear it. A slimy sliding sound like something from the kitchen drain, or a clicking sound like claws being dragged lightly over a staircase banister. You close your eyes, knowing that hearing it was bad. But if you saw it... And always you'd be afraid that the noises might stop for a little while. And then there would be a laugh right over your face and breath of air like stale cabbage in your face and then hands on your throat. So I moved him. I knew it would go for him, see? Because he was weaker and I did it. That very night he screamed in the middle of the night and finally when I got up the cojones to go in he was standing up in bed and screaming, the boogeyman daddy, boogeyman want to go with daddy go with daddy but I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't and an hour later there was a scream an awful gurgling scream and I knew how much I loved him because I ran in I didn't even turn on the light I ran ran and oh Jesus God Mary, it had him. It was shaking him. Shaking. I could see something with awful slumped shoulders and a scarecrow head, and I could smell something like a dead mouse in a pop bottle, and I heard... I heard it when Andy's neck broke. <gasps> It made the sound like ice cracking when you're skating on a country pond in winter. Then what happened? Oh, I ran. I went to an all-night diner. How's that for a complete cowardice? Ran to an all-night diner and drank six cups of coffee. Then I went home. It was already dawn. I called the police even before I went upstairs. He was lying on the floor, staring at me, accusing me. A tiny bit of blood ran out of one ear, only a drop, really. And the closet door was open, but just a crack. Hmm. 
make an appointment with the nurse. In fact, several of them. Tuesdays and Thursdays. I only came to tell my story. To get it off my chest. I lied to the police, see? Told them the kid must have tried to get out of the crib in the night. They swallowed it. Course they did. It's just what it looked like. Accidental, like the others. But Rita knew. Rita. She finally knew. <laughs> Mr. Billings, there's a great deal to talk about. I believe we can remove some of the guilt you've been carrying. But first, you have to want to get rid of it. Don't you believe I do? Not yet. Tuesdays and Thursdays? <sighs> God damn shrink. All right. All right. Make an appointment with the nurse, Mr. Billings, and have a good day. <laughs> All right. Hey, nurse. Nurse? Hey, doctor. Your nurse is... Doctor? So nice. So nice. So nice.